I want to talk to you today on a very, very important aspect of this whole issue of new school. And coming to you, I think, of that great statement by John Owen, which he put, of course, in the form of the Aristotelian logic. No doctrine of election, no gospel, no church. And if you look through the history of churches in this country and elsewhere, you'll find that that has been true again and again and yet again. Somebody asked me during the break if I would explain New Schoolism to you. They've been, you've been using the term, what is the New School? Well, the New School is a rather nebulous group of people, varying from some people who are probably three and a half, three and three quarter point Calvinists, uh, down to those who, who would make uh, the heresies of the ancient church Look, orthodox. <laughs> New School was that branch which broke off in 1837 and went its own way, varying in degree from those who were pretty evangelical and orthodox to those who had no gospel, notably like Charles G. Finney, who, in my humble opinion, was a heretic. I realize that is heresy in many quarters, but I have read, I have read almost everything that, that Finney wrote, and... He was a heretic, but he was of the new school. Now, I realize some people will be offended, but I don't mean to offend you, but I'm going to have to for the sake of truth. <clears throat> to understand the new school, I would beg you to, to think of something of American history from, say, 1810 until 1860. It has been called the, the age of social uprest, uh, uprooting, the social, of social unrest, and it was true. Somewhere around 1810 to 1815, the New England theology became the happy hunting ground of English idealism, which was the happy hunting ground of Hegelianism and Kantianism in the continent of Europe. And the result was what we call transcendentalism, which shook New England, shook the New England's, the new school of theology, and became a veritable pariah in the, on the American political scene, the American social scene. It was the, it was the happy home of the feminists of that day. It was the happy home of the prohibitionists of that day. It was the happy home of the, of the unbelievers of that day. It was the happy home of the social engineers. In 1850, a man by the name of Albert Brisbane wrote a book which is not very well known called The Social Destiny of Man, in which under the influence of Karl Marx of the, of the 1848 series, wrote that the social de the destiny of the American man is to be the great pioneer when we will have a, a society of great people, engineered, of course, by the, soci by the sociologists and so on, as they were, want to be called, and Christianity would be banished. I don't know if you have ever heard of Al Albert Brisbane. He wrote that book in, as, in 1840. He was accompanied on the, on the theological scene by the man who's already been mentioned, and that, of course, was the author, the Albert Barnes, who was a pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Morristown, and who was then called to be the pastor of the, uh, of the First Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This was the home of the prohibitionists. This was the home of the abolitionists. This period from 1810 to 1855 or 60. I would have you note that in all of these schools, of thought, there was a strident unbelief, more pronounced in some than in others. I would have you note this, that in the, pro, in the abolitionist movement, to my knowledge, there were only two Christian leaders. One of them was the president of Wheaton College, and the other was the head of the ill, <laughs> the defunct American party, who they had two elections and lost both of them. The great bulk of the, of the leadership of those movements were transcendentalists, some of them on the verge might be a Christian, others flaunting Christianity uh, and having nothing to do with it. That movement, of course, particularly with its pacifist activity, uh, disappeared in, in the coming of the war. But the war proved to be a very important element in the growth of the, of the movement known as the New, New Church. What most people do not realize is that the war itself was part of the social upheaval which had been engineered before the war. The, the, because in the North, the new party uh, 
was much more numerous than that of the old school, the new school gained the favor of the federal government. And as the war progressed, and as they took over part of our beloved Southland, the new school was given the preference in starting churches and in starting other activities so that uh, the new school played a very prominent part in what we might call the social uh, aspects of, of Reconstruction. Now, what were these social aspects? When the new school got started in 1837, the climate was in favor of the new school. Transcendentalism favored the new school. The, the New England theology favored the new school. So that the new school took root, particularly as had been mentioned in what was called the Old Northwest. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin. That was, politically speaking, the Old Northwest. And that was under the, under the action of 181 uh, with, the, with the Connecticut uh, uh, Congregationalists. In that period of time, the New School advanced westward in Ireland and the other states of the Middle West, going west to the Rocky Mountains. The Old School did not do as well, not even in the North, although it did grow. After the war, the New School had a decided advantage. Now, why did it have a decided advantage? May I point out to you, I do this with kindness, but with conviction, New School theology favored greatly the democratic philosophy. Now, I'm not speaking here of the party, and I don't want you to think I am. I'm speaking of that movement, which gained fruit, gained rootage before the war, particularly in transcendentalist circles, uh, and even in, in uh, Abraham Lincoln. If you'll take note of his great speech at Gettysburg, it had tremendously fine English. There's no question about his use of English, and I was certainly not in any way derogate from it. I would point out that underneath that fine flowering language lay a deadly disease, the disease of democracy. The war brought with it the triumph of the democratic philosophy in the North, not in the South, but in the North, and it found its home in the Republican Party. Many of the leaders of the Reconstruction movement in the North were, at least two of them I know of, were atheists. And, and unbelief was rampant in the movement. Thaddeus Stevens was, of course, one of them, and I, will, I don't need to mention the others. But that is the situation, that is the, that is the problem. And this democracy, as it did before the war, favored the new school of theology. Don't ever forget it, that the new school of theology favored a loose interpretation of the Constitution and, and also of the Scriptures. The two went hand in hand. As a matter of fact, the war between the states was the death knell of the American constitutional system. I don't mean by that that it disappeared then. I am not saying that. I am saying that the root of, of its decay, the root of what we have today in our lawlessness was laid during the war. One man in the government saw that, Andrew Johnson. If you read his speeches to Congress, they are masterpieces of constitutional law in which he, he really interpreted a law to a Congress that wasn't too familiar with it. <clears throat> the, the, the democratic philosophy swept the North, and thus it gave a blessing to a theology which would agree with it. The old school theology, although it had strong roots in and around Princeton Seminary with the Hodges and their group, it had strong roots in the, in the Philadelphia area. They had some strong preaching there. And around Pittsburgh, it also had some strong roots. The, the, the old theology was not dead. But the new theology was the theology of the day. <clears throat> and it became very popular in the, in the thinking of the North after the war. This lay at the heart of the Reconstruction system. You see, the great citadel has been said, and rightly said, the great citadel of, of old school thought was in the Southern Presbyterian Church and it remained a citadel up, well up until the, until the present century. The, it was also the citadel of constitutional thought. And this is not so obvious and I, I should say this, that when I went to graduate school I started major in American constitutional history. We had the great blessing, and I mean blessing, of of Dr. H. V. Ames, 
who was a direct descendant of William Ames of Puritan fame and whose view of the Constitution was largely that of Samuel Rutherford and uh, who pointed so many things out to me. He took to me for some reason or other. I was a, I was a hapless, you know, a, a young graduate student just basing upon the, the, the uh, academic scene of a big university and he took to me. I took to him and I was blessed. I didn't realize at the time, but I was blessed beyond measure by having a contact with that man. Uh, my second year, he died. Some of the students told me I was the cause of that problem. <laughs> I may have been. I don't know. But I fell heir uh, to the czar of the faculty, certainly of the graduate faculty, who was a descendant of the first Presbyterian families that came to Virginia in the late 17th century. I didn't believe the time, so I looked it up. Uh, in the Presbyterian records, that happened to be true. And that was a blessing. I started out in constitutional history, and a man in church history wanted me. And so he, he beguiled me. Uh, he wanted me to go abroad in 1938, and I didn't want to go abroad in 1938. And so he settled by making me the curator of the Henry Charles Lee Memorial Library of Church History, which was, I didn't deserve it, but he gave it to me. I just want to explain that. I did major in constitutional history. I offered both for my degree, since I couldn't get out of one or the other. <laughs> And this is true. Constitutionalism is, is the property of old school theology. Strict interpretation, strict construction, as we found in the Adopting Act of, of 1729. Loose construction favors a democratic philosophy. Everybody for himself, every group for himself. Now, that was not the only opponent which the old school faced and which favored the new school. The second one, and probably equally or more dangerous, was the development of the evolutionary thought. You may remember that, that, uh, that Darwin's first book came out in 1859 on the origin of the species. It didn't receive much attention in this country until after the war. And the, but in the meantime, some young American students were going over to England to study at the end of the war and were coming back filled with Darwinism and Kantianism, Hegelianism and all the other isms of the day which were floating around the European sky. So that Darwinism became the second great opponent. That's all better, already been alluded to this morning very accurately in regard to, to the situation at Columbia Theological Seminary. What is not so well known is that it, it was circulated uh, among the intelligentsia of the South. The great opponent of this was the old school theology. The new school theology, both North and South, yielded very quickly. If you read the history of Yale, Harvard, uh, and the uh, and the, uh, Andover and the other schools of the North, they yielded and became hotbeds of the interpretation of Darwin, which was then pre uh, uh, very, very popular. I would suggest sometime, uh, I, my students, I'll excuse you from this uh, for the time being anyway, get a hold of Jacques Barzon's book, Darwin, Marx, and Wagner. How many have ever heard of it? I know my students have. It's a great book. It was written by Jacques Barzon, who was an exiled man from the from Sorbonne. He saw Hitler coming in 1938, and he took off to this country. And Columbia University felt it was great to have a European exile in their faculty. It sounded great, but they didn't know what they were getting. <clears throat> he got there, and he wrote the, his first book, jarred everybody. It was called The Teacher in America. The, the chapter I loved and rolled around the floor reading was his chapter on called Deans Within Deans, or Wheels Within Wheels. It's the most accurate description of American University I've ever seen. And he applied it, he applied it to Columbia University, which didn't make him very popular. <clears throat> but his great work was Darwin, Marx, and Wagner. And there he graphically illustrates the great opposition of Darwinism to decency. The great opposition to Darwin to, to American culture, and above all, uh, to the church, to evangelical Christianity. I think Barzal was a Catholic, but he read the signs of the times with deadly accuracy. <clears throat> so that democracy became the second great, I mean, the evolution became the second great enemy. It did not make much headway in the South until, well, I would say 1900. We had the, the, the episode of Joseph Woodrow at Columbia Theological Seminary, but that was a rather isolated episode, not 
one that was uh, repeated every day. <clears throat> the third great enemy, if I might say so, to the old theology, to the old theology and, and friendly to the new theology, was the American victory over the South in the war. You see, how many have ever read the, the great journal published for three years called The Land We Love? How many have ever heard of it? I'm overwhelmed with the response. Nobody. <laughs> when, when General D.H. Hill came back from the war, he went back to his old position of teaching mathematics and science at Davidson College. He was a great and noble Christian. He was a very able general, as you know. He was also a very, very able scholar in general. And he and his colleagues, colleagues took up the writing of a, a defense of the South in terms of a monthly journal. It's called The Land We Love. It, and it's available in, in many of the older colleges, libraries. I know that Furman has it. The University of South Carolina has it. And schools of that age and ilk uh, have it in their... In their, uh, certainly in the South, have it in their libraries. You'll, you'll love it. But it, it, depicts, it depicts the situation from the point of view of, uh, shall we say, the intellectual climate. And the intellectual climate, see, in the North at that time, that God gave victory to the North. Therefore, God blessed democracy, God blessed the North, and by the same token, God didn't bless the South. And so the South was dragging behind the North, and, and the Southern concept of constitutional government, the Southern concept of church government, the Southern concept of, of Calvinistic culture was in question. North of the Potomac River, north of the Mason-Dixon line, it was in serious question. And that greatly hurt the, situ hurt the old school. At the same time, it gave the new school a, a boast. If this was a class, I'd ask if there were a question at this time, but since this is not a class, I won't bore you with a question. <clears throat> How did this affect the situation? It affected it in this way, that until, until Woodrow Wilson, no real Southerner was elected to the presidency of the United States. <clears throat> and, of course, you know the whole story of Reconstruction. The whole story of Reconstruction was not merely a political ploy. It was that. But underneath it, you can find out this philosophical, this theological problem. Um, how many of you have ever read the novels of John Dixon? I have two candidates for greatness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. <clears throat> they, they depict brilliantly... The, the situation from a theological and a philosophical point of view as does the land we love. <clears throat> so that the political picture, the social picture, the e and the economic picture all spoke with one voice that the, the South had been defeated. Thus, new school theology, which was running rampant in the North, held the day. Now, in 1869... A day which I would regard as one that, if I might use a non-Calvinistic phrase, one of the most fateful in the history of Presbyterianism <clears throat> was the meeting of the old school North and the new school North at Pittsburgh, <clears throat> at which time the two schools came together to form the Presbyterian Church USA, which we know today by title. What is not so well known is the fact that in that meeting, not one word was said about the causes of separation in 1837. The whole cause of, shall I say, a strict construction, a literal, a, a, a strict reading of the scriptures under the standards of faith was not discussed at all. They came together and they sang hymns and fine hymns and all that sort of thing. But the basic issue was never touched. Thus, <clears throat> in Presbyterian in the North, New schoolism was incorporated and was as much a respected part of, uh, of, the, of the ecclesiastical picture as was old school. In fact, it was more respected because it was more numerous. Now, <clears throat> I would point out one more f factor. 
And this is a factor which is probably very touchy, but the factor was this, the kind of evangelism which was carried on in the North during and after the war. I'm speaking of Presbyterianism, but it was done by other groups as well. Now, <clears throat> I would not have you think that I'm opposed to evangelism. I most certainly am not. I would not have you think I'm opposed to bringing people to church. I most certainly am not. But the kind of evangelism which became very popular uh, after the war was that espoused by Charles Finney. Now, <clears throat> I don't mean to imply that all the evangelists were like Charles Finney. They couldn't be, uh, even those who aped him. But, <clears throat> but you know the kind of evangelism which broke out then and which came down into the modern world. Uh, and uh, Sinclair Lewis uh, wrote a caricature of it in a book called Elmer Gantry. I don't know how many have read that, but it, unfortunately it's rather true. Uh, the, uh, Finney believed that man engineers his own conversion. The role of the Holy Spirit is, is limited to that final touch of, of completing what, uh, what man has begun and carried on. He made Pelagius look almost orthodox. <clears throat> My students should know that's the meaning of that statement. One of my one of my jobs as a professor of historical theology and church history is to know what's going on in the modern church. Thus, with a degree of religiosity and perseverance, I listen to TV programs calling themselves religious, uh, not because I like them, but because I want to know what is going on. And the average, the, I say the average service, when it's not dealing with the second coming, it, it is, is dealing with conversion, and, and for the most part, these men are guilty of Pelagianism, and um, they're not Arminian, except in the, in the sense in which Arminianism today is almost Pelagianism, but evangelism today, under the impact of the democratic philosophy, has come to this position. You see, today, now thank goodness it's not true at Greenville Seminary, but for, for 19 years, I was head of the history department of the college. And I had the, I had the unhappy role of watching the academic training and the academic ability and everything else about the students go down to new lows. <clears throat> All, so they could hardly read. I won't mention any names, but I had a, a publisher call me. Well, I mean, he's, he's head of a Christian publishing outfit. Uh, called me oh, about three, three or four weeks ago, and he wanted me to simplify my theological interpretation of American history. And I, I, asked, I asked him why. He said, well, uh, we have found out that, that it isn't, isn't usable today without today's students. And I thought, well, that's their problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, I couldn't simplify it. Um, when my theory, from my from rational from rational to rationality came out, my son-in-law suggested that I tell the Preston Reform Publishing Company that they should give a free copy of the dictionary to everybody that bought the book. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me to he wanted me to simplify that. You can't simplify Van Til, <clears throat> at least I can. <clears throat> but, but today. To get back to the main point, the day is that you are facing a, situ a situation in which, in which Christian theology, such as you and I knew it, such as you and I were taught it, such as you and I should know it today, such as we should and do teach it at Greenville Seminary, that today is difficult for people to comprehend. And as I understand the public school system, it's going to be more difficult because they haven't reached the bottom yet. They're fast approaching it, but they're not there yet. With this in view, <clears throat> let's look at the 20th century. About 1876, a new development took place <clears throat> known as the Summer Bible Conference Movement. Uh, first at, up at Niagara Falls, and then it spread to Northfield, Minnesota, and from there it became very popular in the North and to a degree in the South. By 1910, that movement had been taken over by dispensationalism. 
by 1920, that had become very popular. And it wasn't some years later than that. I, I, for a time, I had thought I'd become a church organist. And uh, I did play the piano. I took organ lessons. And I, I speedily learned after three years of church organ that I could expect to have an early death. I would starve to death. So I, I, um, I, I, I turned over completely to studies for the ministry. However, <laughs> the Bible college movement, with all its good intentions, became heavily, heavily inundated with dispensationalism. And dispensationalism in, in its guise became the great foe of what you and I believe almost as great as, as the other foes we faced. But this one had a religious garb. It had a religious halo hanging heavily over its head. And so many people felt that they were now getting the truth for the first time. They hadn't gotten in their pulpits or in their churches. <clears throat> with all this facing us, <clears throat> and with the new school underlying what theology, the, the Bible college movement had, I should say the, the, the Bible uh, conference movement had, it was then, by 1920, facing one more hurdle. And that was the Bible college movement. With all due respects to you who have gone to Bible colleges, I know some of you have. I do not know, but of one or two Bible colleges who pay any attention to the doctrine of the election. Now, this may be an unprovable situation for me, but I always think that back to John Owen. No doctrine of election, no gospel. No gospel, no church. On the other hand, I always come and get my hope raised from St. Augustine. Omnia referenda est ad gloriam dei. All things must be referred to the glory of God. So in the depth of despair, I still remember Augustine's great statement. Omnia ad gloriam dei referenda est. All things must be referred to the glory of God. And that's where I stand today. But I, I took hope even in that day. Because in 1905 and 1910, the Presbyterian Church USA in General Assembly made affirmations of faith. Now, I would like it to this picture. One time when I was conducting a tour to Alaska, I sat in a hotel room in uh, Portland, Oregon. I looked out upon Mount Hood. I don't know whether any of you have ever had that experience or not, but I could see Mount Hood, a great, a great pyramid rising with no foundation. Beautiful, beautiful snow-capped mountain in July, I think it's July, August. Beautiful, almost perfect symmetry but I couldn't find the base. Modern evangelical theology <clears throat> is like that. <clears throat> when, when they made those affirmations of 1905 and 10, and when that great series of books was published called The Fundamentals of 1910-11, they were propounding a great deal of biblical truth. <clears throat> I would not deny that. But, They did not have the basic foundation by which that would live. And so, if you take the history of the Presbyterian Church USA from 1905 or 1910 on, what do you find? You find that new school theology ate its way into the very heart of the church. At the end of World War I, what they called the New Life Movement, New World Movement, which was an attempt to get all the churches together to convert the world. And then 1924, you have the Auburn Affirmation with about a little over a thousand members, ministers signing it. <clears throat> you have a deterioration. And, and of course, the, the, the attack on Princeton Seminary in 1929, which was the last great st stone hold for old school theology in the North. <clears throat> and you know what happened. They appointed a new board, they took over, and that school was in the hands of new school theology. Finally, <clears throat> After World War II, that church went down the drain, and John Owen's prophecy was true. No doctrine of election, no gospel. Now, there are pockets of gospel in that church, and I will not deny that. We, we are blessed with one in Salisbury. He's my wife's cousin, my cousin-in-law. He's a great man, <clears throat> but there's not very many of them. 
And we've seen other churches, so-called Reformed churches, cease to become churches. We have seen the, the evangelical movement today in this country collapsing. If you do not believe me, take some of the journals you knew, which were published, say, in 1950, 1940, and compare them today. Because without the old school theology, without a strict construction of the scriptures, without the adopting act of 1729, without that, the evangelical structure will collapse. Somebody asked me at the dinner today, am I a pessimist? The answer is no. I believe that Christ's church will ever live. I believe in those great truths, the church's one foundation. I believe in all that. But I'm a realist. I'm a historian. I, some years ago, I had the great privilege of spending two days with Arnold Toynbee when he was lecturing in this country. And I asked him some of these questions. He had no hope. He, he saw that every civilization thus far has collapsed, which is true. And he predicted, he predicted the same for our civilization in a toneful, sad voice. That was 1961 in, in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. So I would close this, my lecture with this great admonition, this great point that we as a seminary, that we as a church, must hold to the Adopting Act of, of 1729. It's still in force, it's still on the books, and it can be ours. We must have strict construction, or under the democratic impulses, we will collapse and disappear from the pages of history. Thank you.